Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, passage will be up on the screen. If you have a Bible, we would encourage you to pull that out and follow along with us. Daniel chapter 10, the whole chapter, really through verse 1 of chapter 11. So Daniel 10, 1 through 11, 1. And if you are able to stand, please stand for the reading of and the honoring of God's word. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep, with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. Behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips, Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said, O man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. There's a lot of splendor and radiance in this passage, reflective radiance and splendor, and I pray that that would help us better grasp and stand in awe of your splendor and radiance, O Lord. We tend to have such small views of you, small views of God, and help us to leave, Father, with an enlarged vision that we might enjoy you more and be more inclined to rest in you rather than struggling on our own. We love you so much. Holy Spirit, work in great power among us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there's plenty of real, or at the very least, functional atheism to go around these days concerning the reality of spiritual warfare. You can detect it. In our Halloween costume decisions, adults show up to parties dressed as devils 
or demons or some variation of these entities. You'll even see a few kids dressed up in cute devil costumes as they do their trick-or-treating. You can detect it in our humor. Devils and demons are regularly the subjects of comedy sketch, uh, sketches and skits. SNL uses demons and devils all the time, for example. Notice, conversely, I say this without any humor, that you don't see many people dressing up as an infamous military dictator. No, hi, I'm Paul Pot. And you don't hear all that many jokes about genocide. Why? Because pretty much all of us believe in the realness of brutal military dictators as well as the realness and the terror of genocide. And since they are indeed very real, there's nothing cute or funny about them. Spiritual warfare, atheism, shows up a bit in various surveys as well, most recently at, in a Gallup poll in which 74% of the respondents on this poll claim to believe in God, however you might define God, whereas actually only 58% professed belief in the devil. So 16% of the folks who responded to this poll believe that God is running around unopposed, kind of like running for a a city council seat in a really small municipality. And it suggests something that I've observed anecdotally, that plenty of professing Christians are more convinced of God's existence than they are the existence of the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 6. Later we're going to do a little bit of digging concerning why this Atheism exists and appears to be growing, but our main order of business this morning is to reckon very directly here in Daniel chapter 10 with the realness of cosmic warfare and then in doing so discern what it reveals about God's character, about God's activity, and then our response. Two reflections this morning. Number one, the battle is real. And then number two, the fighter is, is glorious. The battle is real and the fighter is glorious. So let's start with that first reflection. The battle church is very real. In Daniel chapters 10 through 12, we encounter Daniel's final vision, at least the, the final vision contained in this book, beginning with a prologue of sorts here in chapter 10 and then the details of the vision we'll talk about next week in chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 10 picks up in the third year of the Persian King Cyrus's rule, so we're talking around 536 B.C., which indicates a three-year forward time hop from chapter 9, during which the first wave of Israelite exiles returned to Jerusalem and Judah more broadly. A lot happened during that three-year stretch, notably the beginning of Israel's very gradual return to Judah, which occurred in several waves, according to permission granted to the Israelites by the Persian king Cyrus. However, despite this very action-packed three-year time hop, we see in the first three verses of chapter 10 that Daniel's posture toward the Lord is very similar to the posture described at the beginning of chapter 9. Did you notice this? In chapter 9, Daniel was praying to the Lord in sackcloth and ashes. Now here in chapter 10, we once again find Daniel in a very humble estate, specifically a self-imposed, three-week season of mourning, you can see that in verses 2 and 3, in which he set aside meat and wine, as well as the lotions that he would typically anoint himself with to deal with the abrasive nature of his deserty climate. You know things are serious when you read about someone setting aside their avino or their, their jurgens for 21 days. And things were quite serious. 
the returning exiles had not fared well back in Judah. It's been a massive disappointment in general. They were opposed by various adversaries who felt threatened by their return. And their temple rebuilding project, goodness, was going absolutely nowhere. It literally wasn't even getting off the ground. So Daniel mourned, both in solidarity with his struggling people and to make a humble appeal before the Lord for help. I'm hearing reports, Lord, that things are going awful. Would you intervene? And once again, following the same pattern we already discussed in Daniel chapter 9, God responded with a vision. As Daniel stood on the banks of the Tigris River, he saw, and this is verse, verses 5 through 9 now, he saw like an avenger. <laughs> Except it was a heavenly avenger with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. I haven't been to Comic Con before. I know a lot of you have been. God bless you. I think it's great. I don't so what I don't know is if they give ribbons out at Comic Con because people I don't know if there's competitions or whatever, but this guy, if they do would have been first place. And this celestial man was so awesome and so magnificent and glorious, Daniel can't even describe him accurately. That's why he keeps using the word like. He's like this. He's like this. I don't know. He's like this. This, this being was so magnificent, so, so glorious, that Daniel's associates just booked it out of the area even though they never actually saw what Daniel was seeing. The sheer presence of this celestial man was enough to terrify them completely as they sensed the cosmic weight of what was occurring. Daniel didn't flee, verse 8, but as he beheld this vision, his previously radiant countenance became fearful, and he lost all of his strength. And then when the being eventually spoke to Daniel, verse 9, it pretty much ended Daniel. He fell on his face in a deep sleep with his face to the ground. And then, church, we encounter an exchange that confounds our expectations and our sensibilities on at least two fronts. Number one, despite the magnificence of this being, So magnificent that Daniel basically passed out this this man, as you can tell here, an angel, put his hand on Daniel, set him back up, and referred to Daniel as a man greatly loved, that is, by God. We saw the same language back in chapter 9. In other words, you're like, you're hiking Denali. I know some of you have actually done that, too. A grizzly bear charges at you, and then when the bear finally reaches you, when the bear finally comes upon you, he's like, all right, just just bring it in. I want to give you a grizzly bear hug. We're often inclined to believe that glorious transcendence means impersonality, but this exchange shows us that this is not the case in God's economy. This transcendent Celestial being ministers very personally to Daniel. Number two, second thing that confounds our sensibilities and expectations. The report given by this celestial man, now I'm looking at verses 12 through 14, demonstrates that the earthly political battles that Daniel can see are most definitely not the only battles going on. The heavenly being had been making his way to Daniel for quite some time, a journey that was set in motion by Daniel's humility before the Lord, his his whole sackcloth and ashes thing back in Daniel chapter 9. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood this being for 21 days, verse 13, until Michael showed up 
to provide some reinforcement. And then when Michael showed up, it was, it was game, set, match, clearing the way for this heavenly being, this angel, to complete his journey to Daniel. Did these angelic beings, you know, the one referred to that spoke to Daniel plus Michael, did these angelic beings literally fight the prince of Persia? You know, it's like a man against the, the God showdown featuring Russell Crowe. Those of you who love Tolkien or Brian Sanderson or Star Trek or Star Wars or any kind of fantasy or any kind of sci-fi are probably like, there's, those, there's no reason that couldn't be the case. Man against the gods, we're here for it. However, in this case, the prince of the kingdom of Persia language is clearly cosmic because the angel Michael is also described as a prince in the same verse, specifically one of the chief princes. Plus, we just observed the cosmic use of this prince language at the end of Daniel chapter 9, although there's some debate here as we discussed. So in other words, the earthly kingdom of Persia has or had a celestial counterpart, basically an, an evil angel, which tangled with the heavenly messenger that was speaking to Daniel and eventually Michael. And then after a 21-day stalemate, once Michael arrived, the good guys prevailed. That was the report. It's some report. And as Daniel became aware of the presence in the scope of the spiritual warfare that he now understands is going on around him, he was completely overwhelmed. In fact, verse 15, he turned his face toward the ground and he was mute. The dude keeps passing out. Second time now. But honestly, all of us would have done the same thing upon recognizing that earthly battles for all of their ferocity and for all of their terror are only the tip of the iceberg. This is a fascinating way for the Lord to care for Daniel, isn't it? I would love to have been a fly on the wall for the meeting of the heavenly council that made this decision, right? You know, listen, we're all concerned about Daniel. He's struggling a bit emotionally. He's wrestling with some despair. He's in sackcloth and ashes. Now he's mourning for 21 days. So here's what we'll do. Let's send him a being so glorious that it makes Times Square look like a, a Gabby's dollhouse replica you could buy at Target. And on top of that, let's give him some fresh information about cosmic dust-ups occurring in a spiritual realm he can't even see. How about that? This is absolutely not how we would have done it. But here are three reasons, and this is really important, church, here are three reasons why it was actually quite wise and quite loving for God to show Daniel the realness of the cosmic battles that were happening around him. Number one, the realness of cosmic conflict shows Daniel and us that God's apparent silence cannot be equated with inactivity. Daniel was in mourning. He was surely struggling big time to see the hand of God amidst Israel's major struggle. In Judah, it sure looked like they just went back there and God was like, whatever, good luck. You know, why the silence, O Lord, as, as your people flounder? But as it turned out, God was mightily at work in the heavenly places, engaged in battles, in this case via his angels, that Daniel couldn't see and knew nothing about. Reason number two why it was really wise and loving for God to give Daniel this information the realness of cosmic conflict fosters dependency upon God. If we're functional atheists concerning spiritual warfare, we're going to vacillate between rugged determination and total despair, depending on whatever our mood happens to be when we encounter difficult circumstances. We're either going to do some some power posing in the mirror, and then we're going to charge the hill, thinking that you know we can just sort of fix everything if we work hard enough and work smartly enough, or we'll throw our hands up in the air and give up. 
will do one of those two things. But when we come to terms with the realness of spiritual conflict, self-dependence starts to feel a little bit silly, doesn't it? As does despair. Because now we know that we really don't know everything, do we? Or you could put it like this. One of the major, I think, under-discussed causes of despair is thinking we know more than we actually know. And in the place of both of these options, self-determination and despair, church, there can emerge this beautiful dependency upon the Lord that manifests itself in a more robust prayer life, less anxiety. Everyone talks about how we're living in such an anxious age right now. And zeal to put on the spiritual armor that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 in order that we might stand firm even in the evil day. I say this hopefully with as much kindness as possible because I, I just have so much zeal when it comes to prayer. I am convinced that one of the primary reasons for prayerlessness is functional unbelief concerning the reality of spiritual warfare. If we really believed in the scale of the cosmic battles that are happening behind the scenes, I think we'd be praying with desperation, since all of it is clearly beyond our personal power to do anything about And we'd be praying with confidence because the object of our prayers, that is God, is awfully powerful. So much so that the mere presence of his emissary causes Daniel to pass out twice. Third reason why it was wise and loving for God to give Daniel this information. The realness of cosmic conflict gives Daniel and us Reasons for hope when we're in the dark. In many respects, this is just the application of everything we just discussed. If there's more going on than we realize, and there always is more going on than we realize, more than we can truly see, and if there's reasons to believe that the folks on our side are rather impressive and really dependable, especially their commander with the capital C, It makes a lot of sense to be hopeful even when you're in the dark. It makes a lot of sense, even if you're mourning like Daniel, to mourn in parallel with a posture of rejoicing and even positivity. And by the way, if you ever read missionary autobiographies, which I would encourage you to do, or accounts from other Christians who have experienced a lot of suffering, a lot of difficulties, you will find that the secret to perseverance has a lot to do with conviction that there's a lot more going on than they can see and that they're on the right spiritual team. All this reminds me of one of my favorite biblical scenes. This might be my favorite biblical scene other than the resurrection. Let's just put that in its own category. And this is a scene that unfolds in 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Syria was making war against Israel and had arrayed his army around the city of Dothan, not the one in Alabama, in an attempt to seize the prophet Elisha. When Elisha's servant woke up one morning and saw this military array around Dothan, he totally panicked and he cried out to Elisha, Alas, my master, What shall we do? I mean, I woke up, I got my coffee, and bam, army around the whole city. And Elisha responded to him saying, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, check this out, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And you know, church, God and his spiritual army are working on our behalf even now. That wasn't just 
for Elisha, that's for us today. Imagine what we would see if the Lord was pleased to open our eyes in the same way that he opened this servant's eyes. And you know, he does open our eyes in part by giving us accounts exactly like these that we can look back on and read. A great reference here is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they, that is angels, not all ministering spirits sent out, that is by God, to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Answer, you bet they are. And they're ministering to us even now in the cosmic places, in the heavenly places that we can't see. More about this team, though. More about this team, especially the commander. A massive theme comes through in Daniel chapter 10 that bolsters everything we've just been talking about, which brings us to our second reflection. The fighter is glorious. The battle is real and the fighter is glorious. He is gloriously holy. When we last visited with Daniel, we saw him pass out a second time. And once again, the being now described in verse 16 as one in the likeness of the children of man ministered to Daniel, first by touching his lips that Daniel might regain his ability to speak, and then by touching him a second time, verse 18, that Daniel might regain his physical strength, and then by giving Daniel an encouraging word, verse 19, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. Why be strong and of good courage? As the angel puts it in verses 20 and 21, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these, except Michael, your prince. There is, of course, some not great news here for Daniel. Do you see this? Do you think the prince of Persia is a problem? Wait till the prince of Greece shows up. The revolving door of adverse circumstances for the Israelites is clearly going to keep spinning for the foreseeable future. But here's the really good news. Even though the revolving door of adversity will indeed keep spinning, even though when, when one adversary declines, another one will emerge, there will always be one constant. God. Specifically God and his army of angels. Adversity will continue, but it will always be, church, God versus fill in the blank. It will always be God versus the Persian prince, God versus the Greek prince, whatever. Various challenges will keep running up the hill. But God's kingship of the mountain will endure. And then one day on the glorious day of the Lord that the prophets foretell, the challenging of God's kingship will end forever. And then it will just be God, the mountain, and God's people enjoying eternal righteousness in the most holy place. Daniel 9.24 Why? Because of God's glory. Because of his mostness. That's why it will always be God versus fill in the blank until all the adversaries are vanquished. Because of his glory, God has the most power. God has the most radiance. He's got the most knowledge. He's completely set apart. There is none like him. I mean, if, if the messenger that Daniel chatted with and passed out twice in the presence of is that radiant and that spectacular, guess how spectacular is the one who sent him? Consider God's radiance, if this is the radiance of his emissary. 
Our adversaries are nothing to be trifled with. Consider that the prince of Persia, this angelic counterpart, this evil angel, was able to delay this celestial man for a while, for 21 days. That's significant. But ultimately, that man, plus Michael, overcame the prince of Persia. Because God always fights for his people. And he always wins. In fact, that victory, both the many victories and the long-term victory, are written clearly in this this book of truth that the angel describes in verse 21. We're going to unpack some more of that next week in chapters 11 and 12. Why is there so much atheism these days concerning spiritual warfare, at least functional atheism? I think a very significant reason for that is we are losing gradually our sense of the transcendent. We are becoming more and more captivated by what's in front of our faces (laughs) and a, a malaise, almost kind of a spiritual boredom is starting to set in, just kind of like the blahs. When I have conversations with people spiritually, a lot of them are just kind of like, yeah, I I don't know what to think. Spiritual boredom, you might say. And when we lose our sense of the transcendent, not only do we lose our sense of God's majesty and God's glory, we lose our sense of the fact that we're opposed and that a cosmic battle is going on. And I think one of the best ways to sort of arrest ourselves out of the malaise, out of this boredom, is actually to tell stories. And so let me tell you a quick story. I'm bringing this back. This is from a few years ago, but most of you probably weren't even here. This was actually right before COVID, a few weeks before everything kind of shut down. I want to remind you of something that might arrest us out of our malaise a little bit. Um, In February of 2020, Pastor Abdi spoke here at City Church. She's preached here a couple of times. Pastor Abby is the president of the Venezuelan collection of free churches. Uh, we're a part of a denomination called the Evangelical Free Church of America. There's also a lot of free churches in Venezuela, somewhere between 80 and 100, because they've been planting churches like crazy for the past few decades. Pastor Abdi is the president, uh, lives in Venezuela. He's come and spoken here a couple of times, and when we were having dinner, Uh, He mentioned uh, an account of some events that had transpired rather recently before he came and he spoke to us in 2020. Uh, As a part of that church planting movement, he was trying to go to an area of Venezuela that you're not really supposed to go to uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, And the power brokers in Venezuela and the area had made it very clear that he really should not be going to this place. Otherwise, he could be in, in pretty dire straits. But he won anyway. (laughs) And when he got there to preach the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, a group of people came to take his life. But for a while, they actually just kind of sat back and listened to everything that was going on, listened to what he was saying, and just sort of like scoped out the scene. And eventually they became so captivated that instead of just going ahead and killing him or whatever. They just took in the message. And Abdi says that everybody in that collection of people that came to kill him became followers of Jesus. So I want to say two things. Number one, (coughs) this whole business about people showing up to kill Pastor Abdi, I mean, that's got to be cosmic, right? There's something going on. I mean, he's a cool guy, but he's not that impressive. He doesn't attract that much attention. And then this whole business about all of them becoming followers of Jesus despite their initial attentions. I mean, that feels awfully cosmic. He's a good preacher. You heard him preach if you were here in the February 2020. He's not that good, let me tell you. <laughs> and then here's what happened after that. He went back a second time. And a second delegation of people came to kill him. And they sat back and listened. And all of them became followers of Jesus. And last I checked, Pastor Abdi is still alive. 
Didn't check my email this morning, but as far as I know, he's still kicking. The battle is very real, as you can see here. But God fights for us. And the fighter is glorious. And he has won and he will win. And church, he fights for us. He fights on our behalf. Because of his grace. Not because we deserve the fighting. But on account of this cut off Messiah we talked about last week in Daniel chapter 9. Cut off Messiah. He was cut off so that we might not be cut off. So that we might repent of our sin. Put our hope in Christ. Gaze upon him. Behold his beauty. And be saved. And enjoy eternal righteousness with God in a place that's going to be so spectacular, the whole new city is described as the most holy place. He fights on our behalf because of his grace, which means that followers of Jesus who are here and discouraged and despairing can be so encouraged. We're not meriting this fighting. He's fighting because he loves us. And those of us who are here who would not say that we're followers of Jesus can totally get in on the action. Since God can be your fighter too (laughs) if you will come to him in sackcloth and ashes like Daniel and give your life to him. I pray that's exactly what you would do at some point, even this morning. Amen.